Chapter Seventy One Elizabeth The Story of How England Was Saved from the Spaniards. Philip, King of Spain, who had been married to Mary the First, wanted after her death to marry her sister Elizabeth, who was now Queen of England. But Elizabeth would not marry him, and that made him very angry. Philip hated the English people and the Protestant religion, and he made up his mind to conquer England and punish Elizabeth. He gathered together a great number of soldiers and sailors and guns and ships, and made ready to invade England. Among the many famous Englishmen of this time was a man called Drake. He had sailed in far off seas to newly discovered countries. And was very bold and daring. While Philip was busy making ready to invade England, Drake sailed over to Spain and boldly entered the harbor where the Spanish vessels lay. He sank and burned thirty or more of them, damaged others, and then sailed away again. This, he said with a laugh, was just singeing the King of Spain's beard. King Philip was very angry. But he at once set to work to repair his ships and to build others, and next year was ready to attack England. In May, fifteen eighty-eight A.D., one hundred and twenty-nine great ships sailed out from Spain. But hindered by a storm, it was many weeks later before they came in sight of the English coast. These Spanish ships, with their gilded prows and white sails shining in the sun. Made a splendid show as they sailed along in the shape of a crescent seven miles long. King Philip called his fleet the Invincible Armada. Invincible means which cannot be conquered. Armada is a Spanish word meaning navy. Once again, as in the days of the Romans and as in the days of the Danes, the little green island in the lonely sea was threatened with conquerors. Coming in great ships, the people of England had been slow to believe that there was any danger from Spain, and the Queen was unwilling to make preparations. But when at last they saw that the Spaniards meant to come, the country rose like one man. Roman Catholics and Protestants forgot their quarrels, and remembering only that they were Englishmen, worked together against the common enemy. The English navy at this time was very small. But gentlemen and merchants gave money and ships, and soon it was almost as large as the Spanish navy, although the ships were smaller. Besides these ships and sailors, a great army gathered on land in order to resist Philip, should he succeed in reaching England, in spite of the wooden walls, as the English war vessels came to be called. Men young and old flocked to the standard. Very few were real soldiers, but all of them were eager to fight for their queen and for their country. Elizabeth herself reviewed the army and spoke such brave words that the hopes of the men who heard her rose high. "I am come among you," she said, "not for pleasure nor to amuse myself. I am come to live or die with you in battle, to lay down my honor and my life for my God, for my country, and for my people." I know that I have but the body of a poor, weak woman, but I have the heart of a king, and of an English king. I think foul scorn that any Spanish prince or any prince in Europe should dare to invade my kingdom. Rather than be so dishonored, I myself will take up arms. Myself will be your general and the judge and rewarder of every one of you for your deeds in the field of battle. So eagerly did the people work that England was ready before Spain, and Lord Howard, the chief admiral, sailed out to meet the enemy. But week after week passed, and as still the Spaniards did not come, he returned to Plymouth with his ships. Elizabeth was not fond of spending money. She thought that it was a dreadful waste to keep all these soldiers and sailors and ships waiting for an enemy who never came. And she told Lord Howard to pay off his men and send them to their homes, but Lord Howard refused to obey, and he, with his captains and his men, held their ships in readiness at Plymouth. Day by day they kept watch, looking always anxiously out to sea, and spending the long, weary hours as best they could. 
At last, one sunny day in July, when Drake and some of the other sea captains were playing at bowls, they were interrupted by a cry, "'The Spaniards! The Spaniards!' The game was stopped. All eyes were turned towards the channel. Yes, there at last, far out to sea, the proud Spanish vessels were to be seen. They were distant yet, but a sailor's eye could see that they were mighty and great ships, and the number of them was very large. But the brave English captains were not afraid. Come, said Drake, after a few minutes, there is time to finish the game, and to beat the Spaniards too. So they went back to their play, and when the game was finished, they went down to the harbor, got the ships ready, and sailed out to meet and fight the Spaniards. For more than a week the battle lasted, the English always having the best of it. Their ships were smaller, but for that very reason they could be moved, and turned about more easily than the great painted and gilded Spanish vessels. The wind, too, was in favor of the English and against the Spaniards. In those days, before steam engines and steamers had been invented, when ships were still moved by sails, the wind was of great importance. Day by day the wind grew fiercer, the waves became white and wild, till the Spanish ships were driven northward by a terrible storm. Without pilots, through unknown seas, past strange islands they were driven. Shattered on unfriendly rocks, refused the shelter of every port, up to the north of Scotland and back round the west coast of Ireland they sped. At last, ruined by shot and shell, torn and battered by wind and waves, about fifty maimed and broken wrecks, all that were left of the invincible armada, reached Spain. Once again England was saved. How the people rejoiced! Bells rang, bonfires blazed, and every heart was filled with thankfulness. In memory of the victory, the Queen ordered a medal to be made, and on it, in Latin, were the words, God blew with his breath, and they were scattered. Although Philip had lost nearly all his ships, he did not consider that he was beaten, and the war went on until the death of Elizabeth. But the English people no longer feared the Spaniards. End of chapter 71. Read by Kara Schallenberg. www.kray.org. On July 27, 2006, in Oceanside, California. Chapter 72. Elizabeth, the story of Sir Walter Raleigh. The reign of Queen Elizabeth was great, not only because she was a wise ruler, but because she was surrounded by so many wise and great and good men. One of these wise men, Sir William Cecil, afterwards called Lord Burley, was her Secretary of State, and her chief adviser during nearly all her reign, until he died in 1598 A.D. There were so many great men in England at this time, that you could not remember all their names, and to tell stories about them all would fill a whole book. In the reign of Elizabeth, it is not only the men who were soldiers that we remember as great, but the men who wrote books, the men who sailed over the sea and discovered new countries, and the men who by careful thinking and wise acts kept peace at home. Sir Walter Raleigh was one of the great men who lived at this time. He was a soldier and a sailor, a courtier and a writer of books. But clever though he was, until the great queen noticed him, he remained only a simple country gentleman. One day Elizabeth was passing along the streets, and the people as usual came crowding to see her. Among them was Sir Walter Raleigh. The queen stepped from her coach and followed by her ladies, was about to cross the road. But in those days the streets were very badly kept, and Elizabeth stopped before a puddle of mud. She was grandly dressed, and how to cross the muddy road without soiling her dainty shoes and skirts she did not know. As she paused, Sir Walter sprang forward, 
He, too, was finely dressed, and he was wearing a beautiful new cloak. This he quickly pulled off, and bowing low, threw upon the ground before the queen. Elizabeth was very pleased, and as she passed on, she smiled at the handsome young man who had ruined his beautiful cloak to save her dainty shoes, and ordered him to attend her at court. Raleigh's fortune was made. He went to court and soon became so great a favourite that at one time he even thought that he might marry the queen. Fain would I climb, but that I fear to fall, he one day wrote, with a diamond upon a window. And the queen, seeing it, wrote underneath, If thy heart fail thee, climb then not at all. So Raleigh climbed, and although he never reached a throne, he climbed high. Elizabeth gave him money and lands, till he became very rich. He wanted to sail away over the sea in search of new countries and treasure, as Drake had done, but the Queen would not let him go. As Raleigh could not go himself, he spent a great deal of his money in buying ships and sending other men over the sea to find new lands. These men sailed to America, which was then wild and unknown. Landing there, they claimed it for England, and Raleigh named it Virginia of Elizabeth. She liked to call herself the Virgin Queen, which means the Queen who has never married. One of the United States of America is still called Virginia. For a long time Elizabeth was very pleased with Raleigh, but at last she became angry with him and sent him to prison in the dreadful tower. The reason for this was that Sir Walter had dared to love and marry another lady, one of the Queen's own maids of honour. Elizabeth was always very angry if any of the gentlemen in her court married. Many of them wished to marry her, but she refused them all. Still, she wished them to think that she was the cleverest and most beautiful woman in all the world. She wished them all to love and admire her, so much that they would never think of marrying any other lady and when they did marry another, she was always very angry. Sir Walter, happily, was not kept in prison very long, and some years later he really did have his wish, and sailed away to explore America. He did not find the golden land which he had imagined, but he brought home many strange stories, and many curious and useful things. Two of the things which Raleigh brought home with him were tobacco and potatoes. Elizabeth had given him estates in Ireland, and there he planted the potatoes, and showed the people how to grow them. Even to this day, the poor people in Ireland grow many potatoes, and live on them very largely. People were pleased with the new vegetable, but they were very much astonished when he showed them how to use tobacco. Such a thing had never been seen before, and it took people some time to grow accustomed to it. One day, soon after Raleigh had returned home, he was sitting smoking, when a servant came into the room. The man stood still in horror. Smoke filled the room and was pouring out of his master's mouth. He must be on fire, thought the servant. Without saying a word, he ran away and returned as quickly as he could with a pail of water. This he threw over his master, hoping to put out the fire and so save his life. Raleigh, you may imagine, was not very pleased at finding himself suddenly drenched with cold water, just when he was enjoying a quiet smoke. But, when he understood the mistake his servant had made, he laughed heartily. Raleigh had many adventures. He swept the ocean in his ships, and he fought by land and sea. But he wrote books, too, and one of his friends was the poet Spencer, who tells the beautiful stories in his poem, The Fairy Queen. The greatest writer of this time, perhaps the greatest poet of any time, was Shakespeare. His name you know, and some day you will read the stories he wrote. Another writer, and great soldier too, was Sir Philip Sidney. He was so handsome and brave and kind that everyone loved him. Queens, statesmen and people, soldiers, courtiers and poets, all loved him. He lived well, wrote well, fought well, and died well. He fell fighting for his country. Wounded and groaning with pain, he asked for a cup of water. While it was being brought, he noticed a soldier lying beside him in great agony. Give it to him, he said, pointing to this poor soldier. 
The man refused to have it. Nay, but take it, said Sir Philip. You need it more than I do. Sir Philip never recovered from his wound. A fortnight later he died, still young, brave, and handsome. End of Part 72 Chapter 73 Elizabeth, the Story of the Queen's Favourite Another brave and handsome man who was a great favourite with the Queen was the Earl of Essex. He was so handsome and graceful that the Queen liked to have him always near her, although she quarrelled with him very often. Essex loved fighting more than attending upon the Queen, and twice when there was war he ran away without leave. Elizabeth was angry, but Essex did great deeds, and helped to make the name of England famous, so she forgave him. Later she made him commander of an expedition which, however, was not very successful. Again they quarrelled. One day the Queen and her councillors were talking about who should govern Ireland. Elizabeth wanted one man, Essex another. He grew so angry because she would not take his advice that he turned his back upon her. This was a very rude thing to do, for one must never turn one's back to a king or queen, but must even walk out of the room backwards when leaving their presence. Elizabeth was furious, and, springing up, she boxed the earl's ears. Essex had been angry before. Now he was in a terrible rage. Forgetting that a man must never fight with a woman, he laid his hand upon his sword— then a gentleman who was there threw himself between the angry queen and earl, trying to calm them both. But Essex would not be calmed. "'I will take a blow from no one,' he cried. "'I would not have endured it from her father, King Henry. I will not take it from a king in petticoats.' And, swearing dreadfully, he flung himself out of the room, refusing to return." For some time the advisers of the Queen and the friends of the Earl tried to make peace between them, but in vain. Essex would not apologize, the Queen would not say that she was sorry. But in the end the Queen forgave Essex, and he came back to court. As they had quarrelled over who should be sent to govern Ireland, Elizabeth decided to send Essex himself. This was not at all what Essex wanted. It was a very difficult post, and he did not wish to accept it, but he was obliged to do so. He went to Ireland, but he did not succeed in ruling as the Queen would have liked. She wrote bitter, angry letters to him, and he replied with letters as bitter and angry as hers. At last Essex decided to come back to England to see the Queen, and try to make friends with her again. Elizabeth forbade him, but in spite of her orders he came. Early one morning he arrived in London, dusty, dirty, and untidy from his long journey. He was in such haste to see the Queen that he did not stop to make himself fit to appear at court. Dusty and untidy as he was, he rushed straight to the palace. It was so early that the Queen was not up. Hearing that, Essex ran to her room, without even waiting till someone had told her that he had arrived. The Queen was sitting in her room, with her hair hanging down, waiting for her ladies to dress her, when Essex rushed in, and, flinging himself on his knees beside her, kissed her hand again and again. The Queen was so surprised to see Essex, and so sorry when she saw how miserable he looked, that she spoke gently to him, and comforted him. So presently he rose from his knees, and went away feeling that he was forgiven. But it was only surprise which had made the Queen kind to Essex. Later in the day she received him very coldly. Later still she sent him to prison. For some time Essex was kept a prisoner, then he was set free, but he could not again win the Queen's favour. Her unkindness hurt him so much that he grew more and more unhappy, and more and more angry. He began to say unkind things about the Queen, calling her a foolish old woman, who was growing crooked in mind and body. 
It was quite true that Elizabeth was growing old, and, being as vain as ever, she liked to think that she was still young and pretty. She covered her grey hair with a wig, and painted her face. She sang and danced, although she was nearly seventy years old. But it was wrong and foolish of Essex to speak as he did, and people were not slow to carry his words to the Queen. At last Essex grew so angry that he tried to raise a rebellion against Elizabeth. The rebellion failed, and Essex and those who had helped him were sent to the Tower. In spite of all their quarrels, Elizabeth really loved Essex. Now she felt it very hard to condemn him to death. Still, she did. Long before this, Elizabeth had one day given Essex a ring, telling him that if ever she should be angry with him, she would forgive him if he sent this ring back to her. When Essex heard that he was to die, he remembered this promise, and he made up his mind to send the ring to Elizabeth, hoping that she would pardon him. But he did not know how to send it. He was afraid to give it to any of the Queen's courtiers, for he knew that many of them were his enemies. They were only too glad that he should be in disgrace, and would never deliver the ring to the Queen. At length one day, as he looked sadly from his prison window, he saw a boy passing. The boy had a pleasant, honest face, and Essex felt sure that he might be trusted. He called to him, and, throwing the ring down, told him to take it to his cousin, who was a kind lady and loved him. "'Tell the lady,' he said, "'to show this ring to the Queen, and all will be well.' The boy took the ring, promising to do as he was asked. Then Essex threw down a purse full of gold, as a reward for his kindness, and the boy went away very pleased. But, by mistake, he gave the ring to the wrong lady. Instead of giving it to the cousin of Essex, who loved him, he gave it to another lady, who hated him. This lady showed the ring to her husband, and, as he, too, hated Essex, they resolved to keep the ring, and say nothing about it. So Elizabeth never knew that Essex had sent it. She, too, had remembered her promise, and hoped that Essex would send the ring. She waited and waited, but day after day went past, and it never came. At last, thinking that he was too proud to ask forgiveness, she ordered his head to be cut off. So proud and foolish Essex died, believing his queen was still angry with him. Elizabeth was growing old. Many of her friends had died and left her, and after the death of Essex she was often very sad. The people, too, who had loved Essex, were angry with her for having put him to death, and that made her more sad still. When the lady who had kept back the ring was about to die, she felt very sorry for what she had done. She could not find peace until she had confessed to the Queen, and asked her forgiveness. She sent a message to the Queen, begging her to come to her. Elizabeth came, but when she heard the story, instead of forgiving the poor dying lady, she shook her fiercely, saying, "'God may forgive you. I never can.' At last Elizabeth herself grew very ill, but she would not go to bed. She sat day and night upon cushions on the floor, doing nothing but staring before her, with her finger in her mouth. Then Sir Robert Cecil, the son of the great Lord Burley, who had been so wise and faithful a friend to Elizabeth, said, "'For the sake of your people, madam, you must go to bed.' "'Must!' exclaimed the Queen. "'Must is not a word to use to princes. "'Little man, little man, your father would not have dared to use that word. "'But you know I must die, and that makes you so bold.' "'At last she allowed herself to be carried to bed. "'Some of her lords, knowing that she had not long to live, "'asked whom she wished to reign after her. "'I will have no rascal's son in my seat,' she said, "'and would say no more.' Later they asked again, "'Do you desire your cousin, the King of Scotland, to have the crown?' The Queen only moved her head, but it seemed to those around that she meant to say, "'Yes. She never spoke again. On March 24, 1603 A.D., this great Queen died, 
having reigned forty-five years. She had loved her country and her people, and her people loved her and wept for her at her death. No ruler had ever before been so mourned. She was the last of the Tudor sovereigns, and with her successor James, a new race of kings, called the Stuarts, began to reign in England. End of chapter 73 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org In Montreal, Canada, visiting Hugh McGuire On um, August 19th, 2006Chapter 74, James the Sixth of Scotland, of England, the story of Guy Fawkes. For hundreds of years, the kings of England had tried to conquer Scotland, and make Scotland and England one kingdom under one king. Many dreadful battles had been fought. Many brave people had been killed. The Scots had lost many battles, but they had never been conquered and at last the kings of England had almost given up hope of ever being able to conquer them. But now, what they had longed for, and fought for in vain, happened quite quietly and naturally, although not at all in the way that they had expected. Instead of an English king conquering and ruling over Scotland, a Scottish king came to rule over England. Elizabeth Tudor, Queen of England, being dead, James Stuart, King of Scotland, was the rightful heir to the throne. James the Sixth of Scotland was the son of the beautiful and unhappy Mary, Queen of Scots, was descended from Margaret Tudor, the sister of Henry the Eighth, and was Elizabeth's nearest relative. At the Queen's death there was no man nor woman left in England who had any right to the throne. So the English sent to Scotland, and asked the Scottish king to come to be their king too. He came, and since 1603 A.D., England and Scotland have formed one kingdom with Wales and Ireland. So now we will no longer talk of England, but of Britain, for long ago the old hatred has been forgotten, and we are all Britons. James had been king of Scotland for many years before he became king of England too. He was a very little boy when he was first made king, and Scotland had been ruled by a regent. James had been carefully taught, but unfortunately his teachers had thought more of making him clever than of teaching him things which would have made him a great ruler. Some people called him the British Solomon, but because he was such a mixture of wisdom and foolishness, he has also been called the wisest fool in Christendom. Although his mother, Queen Mary, was a Roman Catholic, James had been brought up a Protestant. The English Roman Catholics thought, however, that in memory of his mother, James would be kinder to them than Elizabeth had been. Elizabeth had not burned and tortured the Roman Catholics as her sister Mary had burned and tortured the Protestants. Still, they were not quite kindly treated. They had not equal rights with the Protestants and was sometimes looked down upon. The Roman Catholics soon found out that James had no intention of being kind to them, and they became very angry. So angry did they become that they formed a plot to kill the king and all the chief Protestants in the country. Having done this, they intended to place James's little daughter, Elizabeth, upon the throne, and make Britain a Roman Catholic country once more. Princess Elizabeth was of course being brought up as a Protestant, but she was such a little girl that the Catholics knew she would only be a make-believe queen. Until she grew up, the country would really be ruled by the Catholic gentlemen, and meantime they would have time, they thought, to teach her to be a Roman Catholic. The first thing to be done was to kill the king and all the chief Protestant gentlemen. To do this, the conspirators, as the people who form a plot are called, thought of a very dreadful plan. They decided to wait until Parliament was sitting, until the King and all his wise men were gathered together in one place, and then they would blow them up 
with gunpowder. Underneath the Houses of Parliament there were cellars. These cellars were let to merchants and other people who wished to store goods. It was quite easy for the conspirators to rent one of these cellars, and into it they carried thirty-six barrels of gunpowder. Besides the gunpowder, sticks and firewood were piled into the cellars by the conspirators. This was done partly to hide the barrels, and partly, no doubt, to help to burn the Houses of Parliament when they were set on fire. Nobody paid much attention to the barrels as they were being taken in, and nobody thought of asking with what they were filled. For a year and a half the plot went on. Very few people knew of it, and those who did were bound by an oath never to talk of it. They met secretly at night, speaking only in mysterious whispers. At last everything was ready. Guy Fawkes, one of the most fearless of the band, was chosen for the most difficult and dangerous part. He was to set fire to the gunpowder. Having done so, he meant to try to escape, but if he could not, he was quite ready to die in what he thought was a good cause. The day was fixed for the 5th of November, when Parliament would be opened. A man called Francis Tresham had joined the plot. He had a friend, a Roman Catholic nobleman, who was sure to be among the lords who would attend this Parliament. Tresham could not bear to think of his friend being killed, so he wrote a letter to him in a disguised hand, warning him not to go to this Parliament. My lord, said the letter, out of the love I bear to some of your friends, I have a care for your life. Therefore I advise you, if you love your life, to make some excuse so that you need not go to this Parliament. God and man are agreed to punish the wickedness of this time. Do not think lightly of this warning, but go away into the country where you may be safe. For although there is no sign of any stir, yet I say, they shall receive a terrible blow, this Parliament, and yet they shall not see who hurts them. Tresham's friend was very much disturbed by this letter. He took it to Lord Salisbury, who took it to the King. The King, who was afterwards very proud of his cleverness, said that the terrible blow which was to be given, without the person being seen, must mean gunpowder. It was clever of the King to think of this, but some people say that Salisbury had already found out about the plot, and perhaps he put the idea of gunpowder into the king's head. About midnight on the 4th of November, the day before Parliament was to meet, the cellars under the houses were searched. With hushed voices, drawn swords and dim lanterns, the searchers moved from cellar to cellar. All seemed empty, silent and dark, till in a far corner a faint light was seen, and near it the dark figure and pale face of Guy Fawkes. In a moment they were upon him. He tried to defend himself, but it was useless. Stern men with drawn swords closed in upon him, and he was soon a prisoner. He could not deny his guilt. Round him were the barrels, in his pockets were those things which he needed to set fire to the gunpowder. He knew he must die. Oh, would I had been quicker, he said. Would I had set fire to the powder. Death would have been sweet had some of my enemies gone with me. Guy Fawkes was taken to the tower. In the cruel manner of those days, he was tortured to make him tell the names of the others who were with him in the plot. But Guy Fawkes was very brave, although he was wrong and he would not tell. The others, seeing that part of their plot had failed, hoped still to succeed in gaining possession of the Princess Elizabeth so they hastily rode to the country house where she was living. But part of the gunpowder which they took with them was set on fire and exploded by accident. It hurt some and frightened all of them, for they thought it was a punishment sent upon them because of what they had intended to do to others. The Roman Catholics in the country did not rise to help the conspirators as they had expected, and soon all hope of success was lost. The chief of the conspirators were seized, and were put to death along with Guy Fawkes. After this the Protestants hated the Roman Catholics more than ever, 
and their lives were made very hard. There was great rejoicing at the discovery of the plot. Bells rang and bonfires blazed, and even now, after three hundred years, the day is not forgotten. On the 5th of November, people still have fireworks and bonfires, on which they burn a figure made of straw and old clothes, which is meant to represent Guy Fawkes. End of part 74 Chapter 75 James the Sixth of Scotland, first of England, the story of the Mayflower. When Henry the Eighth broke away from the Church of Rome, he did not make much change in the services or in the ruling of the Church. He merely said that the Pope had nothing to do with the Church in England, and he commanded the services to be read in English instead of Latin. But by degrees many Protestants began to think that the Church of England was too like the Church of Rome. They wanted to have no prayer book at all. They wanted to have very simple services, and very simple churches. These people were called Puritans. They were very stern and grave, but many of the best and bravest men in England joined them. At this time men did not wear plain dark clothes as they do now. They wore bright colours, and their clothes were often made of silk and velvet, and trimmed with lace. They wore their hair long and curly, and they had feathers in their hats. But the Puritans thought this gay dress was wicked. They cut their hair short, and wore dark clothes, and plain linen collars, instead of lace and feathers, and gay-coloured silks and satins. They even spoke in a slow and sad tone of voice, using curious and long words, and they very seldom laughed. The Puritans felt that in England they could not worship God in what seemed to them the right way. So, although they loved their country, they resolved to leave it, and sail away over the sea to the new lands which had been discovered. There they would found a new England, where they could be free. The first of these Puritans who left England were called the Pilgrim Fathers. The ship they sailed in was called the Mayflower. There were only one hundred of them men, women, and children. Before they started there were many sad partings. All left dear friends behind. Some said good-bye for ever to fathers and mothers. Some left their wives and little children, hoping one day to be able to send for them, when they had made a new home far over the sea. But, sad as they were, their hearts were full of hope, and in spite of tears they sang hymns. They started in the summer, but they had so many delays and misfortunes that it was winter before they reached America. They did not come to the part of America to which they had expected to come, but reached land much further north, where the winter was very cold, far colder than the English winter. As the little Mayflower drew near, the shore of their new home looked very dark and dreary to those pilgrim fathers. There were no people to greet them on the beach, no houses with twinkling lights by night and cheerful smoke by day. There was nothing but the rough rocky shore, and beyond it a mass of bare brown trees. There was no sound but the roar of the waves, the call of sea-birds, and the cry of wild animals. The little band of pilgrims felt very lonely when they landed in this strange country, hundreds and hundreds of miles from any white people. Dark woods and wilderness lay in front, behind the cold grey sea separating them from all their loved ones, and round them, day and night, the fear of attack from the wild red Indians who inhabited the land. But in spite of dangers and hardships they did not lose heart. Soon the noise of axe and saw was heard in the forest as the pilgrim fathers felled trees and cut them into planks with which to build their houses. Through cold and wind and rain they worked, and a little town of wooden houses rose round the little wooden meeting-house, as they called their church. The building went on slowly, for all the pilgrim fathers could not work at once. Some of them had to keep watch in case of attack from the Red Indians, while the remainder built the houses and laid out the gardens. The little band struggled bravely. They were often cold and hungry, weary and afraid. Still they did not give up hope. They had very little to eat. 
Sometimes they did not even know at night if they would have anything for breakfast in the morning. Once an eagle was shot, and they thought it was a great treat. It tasted something like mutton. Once a sailor found a herring on the shore. As it was only enough for one, the captain had it for supper, but many of the pilgrims, unused to such hardships, died during the winter. At last the dark days passed, and with the sunshine of the spring came brighter times, and with the spring the Mayflower, which had lain in the bay all winter, sailed back to England. With sad hearts the pilgrims saw it go. It was the last link which bound them to their old home. Yet in spite of the longing in their hearts for the green fields and white cliffs of England, in spite of all the hardships they had suffered, not one pilgrim returned home with the Mayflower. They knelt upon the shore, watching with tear-dimmed eyes till the last glimmer of its white sails died away in the distance. Then they turned back to their work. But for many days after the bay seemed sad and empty, with no little Mayflower riding at anchor in it. The Pilgrim Fathers named their town Plymouth, after the town in England from which they had sailed. From these few settlers the great American nation has grown, and although America is no longer a British colony, but a separate nation, it is a nation which has grown out of the British nation. If you look at the map of America, you will see Plymouth marked in the state of Massachusetts. In that town there is a hall called Pilgrim Hall, and in front of it stands a rock which is railed round and carefully preserved. It is the rock which the feet of the Pilgrim Fathers first touched when they landed to found New England. The people of America are proud to remember that they are descended from those stern, brave men and women, so they guard the stone as something precious, and the 22nd of December, the day on which the Pilgrim Fathers landed, is called Forefathers' Day, and is kept as a holiday. The breaking waves dashed high on a stern and rock-bound coast, and the woods against the stormy sky their giant branches tossed. And the heavy night hung dark, the hills and water o'er, when a band of exiles moored their bark on the wild New England shore. Not as the conqueror comes, they the true-hearted came, not with the roll of stirring drums and the trumpet that sings of fame, not as the flying come, in silence and in fear, they shook the depths of the desert gloom with their hymns of lofty cheer. Amidst the storm they sang, and the stars heard, and the sea, and the sounding aisles of the dim wood rang to the anthem of the free. The ocean eagle soared from his nest by the white wave's foam, and the rocking pines of the forest roared. This was their welcome home. There were men with hoary hair amidst that pilgrim band. Why had they come to wither there, away from their childhood's land? There was woman's fearless eye, lit by her deep love's truth. There was manhood's brow serenely high, and the fiery heart of youth. What sought they thus afar, bright jewels of the mine, the wealth of seas, the spoils of war? No, t'was a faith's pure shrine. Yes, call it holy ground, which first their brave feet trod. They have left unstained what there they found, freedom to worship God. End of chapter 75 Read by Kara Schallenberg on August 20th, 2006 Visiting Hugh McGuire in Montreal, Canada Chapter 76. How a woman struck a blow for freedom. Like Queen Elizabeth, King James had favourites, but unfortunately the favourites he chose were not good and wise men who helped him to govern well, but men who, although clever, were bad, and who thought only of themselves. Some of these men liked money and fine clothes, and James spent so much on them that he was always poor and in debt, and this led him into quarrels with the people and Parliament. The Tudors had been a very autocratic race of kings. Autocratic is a word 
made from Greek words, and means that the Tudors wanted to rule quite by themselves, without help or advice from any one. During the time of the Tudors, especially in the reigns of Henry VIII and Elizabeth, the power of Parliament had been much lessened. James tried to lessen it still more. James knew how autocratic Elizabeth had been, and he meant to be the same. But Elizabeth, although she had her own way in many things, knew when to yield and let the people have their way. James did not know how to yield. He wanted to be a despot, which is another word taken from Greek, and really means master, but has come to mean cruel master. The king can do no wrong, said James. What he does must be right, and the people must obey and ask no questions. King James wrote several books, and in one of them he set down his ideas about the power of a king. But the people did not agree with these ideas. They thought many of the things which the king did were wrong. As they would not do everything he wished them to do, James dismissed Parliament, and ruled for many years without calling another. When James died, in 1625 A.D., no one was very sorry. He had reigned for fifty-eight years, thirty-six years as King of Scotland, and twenty-two as King of Great Britain and Ireland. And his people, English, Scots, and Irish, were discontented with his rule. Yet in spite of all he had tried to do, the people were really nearer freedom than before, for they had shown that they would not quietly submit to the rule of a despot. James was succeeded by his son Charles. He had been taught by his father to believe that the king could do no wrong, and like his father, Charles wanted to be autocratic. Charles too dismissed Parliament, because he could not have entirely his own way. He tried to make the people pay taxes, and give him money without the consent of Parliament, and this made them very angry. Like King James, King Charles had bad advisers, and one of the worst, perhaps, was his own wife, of whom he was very fond. She was a French princess called Henrietta Maria, and was a Roman Catholic. She hated the Puritans, who were growing more and more important in England. Charles hated them too, and, with the advice of Archbishop Lord, who was one of his chief advisers, he treated the Puritans very hardly. Many of the people in Scotland had become Protestant. They were called Presbyterians, and like the Puritans, they chose to have a very simple form of worship, and very simple churches. This did not please Charles. He said that the Scottish Church must use the same service as the English Church. He ordered a new prayer book to be made, which was almost the same as the English prayer book. This he sent to all the Scottish ministers, commanding them to begin to use it on Sunday 23rd of July 1637 A.D. There was great excitement among the Scottish people when this order became known. On the Sunday morning many crowded to the Cathedral of St. Giles in Edinburgh, wondering what would happen. When the dean entered, it was seen that he was wearing a white robe instead of the black one in which the Scottish clergy usually preached. The dean knew little of the anger which was rising in the hearts of the stern-faced men and women round him, as the words of the new prayers rang strangely through the silent church. He began the service using the new prayer book, but he had not gone far when an old woman called Jenny Geddes sprang up, "'Thou false thief!' she cried. "'Wilt thou say mass at my ear?' And with that she threw the stool upon which she had been sitting at the dean's head. In a moment the whole church was in confusion. "'The mass! The mass! Popery! Popery!' shouted the people. "'Down with the Pope! Down with him!' The women rushed at the dean and tore his white surplice from his shoulders. He was so hardly used that he ran the risk of being killed. The Bishop of Edinburgh went into the pulpit and tried to calm the people, but they would not listen to him. "'A Pope! A Pope!' they cried. "'Down with him! Down with him!' At last soldiers were sent for, 
the church was cleared, the doors were locked, and the new service was read to the few who were in favour of it. Outside, the crowd yelled and hooted, breaking the windows with stones and hammering on the doors, which were locked and barred against them. The bishop barely escaped with his life. He was carried through the crowd, surrounded by soldiers with drawn swords in their hands. All Scotland was in arms, high and low banded together to resist the king. They drew up a paper which was signed by thousands, binding themselves to fight for the freedom of religion. The paper was called the National Covenant, and the people who signed it the Covenanters. Scotland was ready for war, and Charles was forced to recall the prayer book and allow the Scottish Church to be free. Charles promised the Scottish Church freedom, but he could never keep his word. Soon he raised an army, intending to force them to do as he wished. But the Scots were ready to fight, and they marched into England to meet Charles. The English Puritans were on the side of the Scots, and for the first time in all history, a Scottish army coming into England was welcomed by the English. The fighting ended in a victory for the Scots, and once more Charles promised them freedom in religion. If you should ever go to St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, you will see there is a brass plate in memory of Jenny Geddes and her deed. It is set there not because it is right or wrong to use a prayer book, not because it is better to worship God in one way rather than another, but because it is right that people should be free to pray to God and worship God in their own way. Neither Pope nor King has a right to say how any man or woman shall pray, and it is not because Jenny Geddes fought against the prayer book, but because she struck a blow for freedom that we remember her. End of chapter 76 Chapter 77 Charles I The story of how the King and the Parliament quarrelled, and at last fought. As Parliament would not do exactly as King Charles wished, he ruled without one for nearly twelve years. During these years he was often in need of money, and raised it in many wrong ways. But at last he could get no more money by right or by wrong ways, and he was obliged to call a Parliament. In 1640 A.D., what is known as the Long Parliament began to sit. It was called the Long Parliament because it lasted so long. The people chose the members for this Parliament very carefully, and they were not slow to show the King how strong they were. They beheaded one of the King's advisers because they said he had been guilty of treason. To commit treason means to do anything that is hurtful to the state or government. To commit high treason is to do anything hurtful to the king. The Parliament also imprisoned Archbishop Laud, and three years later he was beheaded. King Charles had quarrelled with every Parliament he had had during his reign. Now the quarrels grew worse and worse. At last, one day, Charles marched to the house, followed by his soldiers, meaning to seize five members who, he thought, were his worst enemies. Leaving his soldiers at the door of the house, Charles went in, and marched up to the Speaker's chair. "'Mr. Speaker,' he said, "'I must borrow your seat for a time.' The Speaker rose, and fell upon his knee before the King, the members standing bareheaded, while the King sat down in the Speaker's chair. Charles looked keenly round the house, but none of the five members were to be seen, they had been warned, and were not there. He called them each by name. Only silence answered. "'Mr. Speaker,' said Charles at last, "'where are those five members whom I have called? Are any of them in the house? Do you see them?' "'Your Majesty,' said the Speaker, again falling upon his knees, "'I have neither eyes to see nor tongue to speak in this place, but as the house may be pleased to direct me. Ah, said Charles, I see the birds are flown. Then, after making a very angry and bitter speech, he left the house 
As he passed out, the silence was broken by cries of rage, for the people felt that the king was trampling on all their rights. The quarrels grew worse and worse, and at last war broke out, war between Britain and Britain. English, Scots, and Irish all joined in this war, and it was called the Great Rebellion. The king and the lords were on one side, and the parliament and the people on the other. Those who followed the king were called cavaliers, or royalists. Those who followed the parliament were called parliamentarians, or roundheads. Cavalier comes from a word which means horse, and the cavaliers were so called because most of them rode upon horses. The roundheads were so called because they wore their hair short instead of long and curling, like the cavaliers. The roundheads were, for the most part, Puritans, while the cavaliers belonged to the Church of England. At this time there was no regular army in Britain, such as we have now, and a great many of those who fought were quite untrained. The king's army was in some ways better than the army of the Parliament, for it contained many gentlemen who were accustomed to danger, and who were able to ride. The Parliamentarians were chiefly working men who knew very little about fighting, but among them there was a brave strong man called Oliver Cromwell. He knew how hard it would be for these working men to conquer, if they were not taught how to fight, so he drilled them and taught them quickness and obedience. So thoroughly did they learn that they became most splendid soldiers, and were called Oliver Cromwell's Ironsides. Never were such strange soldiers seen. In those days a camp was a wild, rough place, but from the camp of Cromwell's soldiers, instead of the sound of drunkenness and laughter, came the sound of psalm-singing and prayer. To many of them the war was a holy war, a battle for the freedom of religion. "'Trust in God and keep your powder dry,' was Cromwell's advice to his soldiers, as one day they were crossing a river to attack the enemy. For four years the war went on. The royalist leaders were Lord Lindsay and the king's nephew, Prince Rupert. Prince Rupert was so fiery and eager in battle that he was called Dashing Prince Rupert. But although he was very brave, he was not a good general, and often did rash things. The chief of the roundhead leaders were Oliver Cromwell, Ireton, and Fairfax. Many battles were fought, sometimes one side winning, sometimes the other. But at last, at a battle called Nazaby, the cavaliers were utterly defeated. Then Charles lost all hope. He had no money left and very few friends. He felt that his cause was ruined, and thinking that the Scots would be kinder to him than the English, he gave himself up to them. The Scots and the English were still friends, and they agreed that if Charles would grant to England the same kind of religion as Scotland, they would set him on the throne again. But Charles would not promise this, so the Scots gave him up to the Parliamentarians. When the war was over, it was found that neither king nor Parliament ruled the land, but the army. The king being now a prisoner, the Parliament said there was no longer any need for the army, and told the soldiers to go back to their homes. But the soldiers refused to go. They knew how powerful they had become, and they resolved to become yet more powerful, and get possession of the king. One evening a man called Cornet Joyce, with about eight hundred soldiers behind him, rode to the house in which King Charles was kept prisoner. Going into the king's room, he told him politely and kindly that he had come to take him away. After some talk, Charles said he was willing to go, but as it was now late, Cornet Joyce must come again in the morning. Accordingly, at six o'clock next morning, the king rose, and, going out to the courtyard, found Joyce and all his soldiers waiting there, mounted and ready. "'I pray you, Mr. Joyce,' said the king, as he looked at the company of stern men in steel armour. "'Deal honestly with me, and show me your commission.' By a commission, 
the king meant a letter to say that Joyce really had orders to take him away. "'Here is my commission,' said Joyce. "'Where?' said the king. "'Here,' said Joyce. "'Where?' again asked the king. "'Behind me,' said Joyce, pointing to the mounted soldiers. "'I hope it will satisfy your majesty.' Then Charles smiled and said, "'It is as fair a commission and as well written as ever I have seen a commission in my life. It may be read without spelling. But what if I refuse to go with you? I hope you would not force me. I am your king, and you ought not to lay violent hands upon your king. I acknowledge none to be above me here but God.' "'We will not hurt you, your majesty,' replied Joyce. "'Nay, we will not even force you to come with us against your will.' So Charles consented to go with them, and asked, "'How far do you intend to ride to-day?' "'As far as your majesty can conveniently ride,' replied Joyce. "'I can ride as far as you or as any man here,' said Charles, smiling, and so they set out. In this way the king became the prisoner of the army, instead of the prisoner of the parliament." End of chapter 77 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On Monday, August 21st, 2006 at Hugh McGuire's house in Montreal, Canada. Chapter 78 The story of how the king was brought to his death. God gives not kings the style of gods in vain, for on the throne his sceptre do they sway, and as their subjects ought them to obey, so kings should fear and serve their god again, if then ye would enjoy a happy reign. Observe the statutes of our heavenly king, and from his law make all your laws to spring. If his lieutenant here you would remain, Reward the just, be steadfast, true, and plain. Repress the proud, maintaining aye the right. Walk always so as ever in his sight. Who guards the godly, plaguing the profane? And so shall you in princely virtue shine, Resembling right your mighty king divine. This poetry was written by James to his son, and perhaps it would have been better, both for James and Charles, had they tried to rule as the poem says kings ought to rule. After Charles became the prisoner of the army, letters and messages passed continually between him and Parliament, and between him and the leaders of the army. Both parties offered to replace the king upon the throne, if he would only promise them certain things. But these things Charles would not promise, for all the time he was secretly plotting with his friends and hoping to free himself. The leaders of the army treated Charles very kindly, allowing him to see his friends and to have a great deal of liberty. This made it easy for him to escape, which he did and fled to Carisbrook Castle in the Isle of Wight. But although he thought that he was going to friends, he found that he was again a prisoner, are more carefully guarded than before. The struggle for power between Parliament and army still went on, but Cromwell was master of the army, and he meant to be master of Parliament too. So one day, when Parliament was about to meet, a man called Colonel Bride surrounded the house with soldiers. As they arrived, each member, who would not do exactly as Cromwell and the other army leaders wished, was seized and turned away. When this was done, there were only about fifty members left. This was called Pride's Purge, because he purged or cleaned away all those who did not think exactly as he did. It was still the long Parliament that was sitting, but people now called it the Rump Parliament, because it was not a real Parliament, but only part of one. Cromwell was master of King and Parliament, but the army was too strong even for him. Against his will he was driven to do a deed from which he shrank. He was driven to condemn the king to death. Charles was accused of high treason against the nation, 
and was brought to London to be tried. This was a crime which had never been heard of before, as high treason means a crime against the ruler. More than a hundred men were called as judges of the king, but scarcely half of them came. Many of them were angry with Charles, and wished him to be punished, but the punishment for treason, they knew, was death, and they did not wish the king to be killed. The judges assembled at Westminster Hall, and King Charles was brought before them as a prisoner. They, who had always stood bareheaded in his presence, now sat with their hats upon their heads, seeing that Charles too kept on his hat, but it was seen that his hair, which had been very beautiful, had grown grey, and that he looked old and worn. Charles had been foolish, he had been wicked, but now in the face of death he behaved with the dignity of a king. The men who sat before him, he said, had no right to judge or condemn him. He would not plead for mercy. Three times he was brought before the court, three times he refused to plead. At last the judges, without further trial, sentenced him to death as a tyrant, a traitor, a murderer, and a public enemy. Calm and dignified as ever, Charles walked out of the hall after the sentence had been pronounced. "'God bless your majesty!' cried a soldier as he passed, and was struck by his officer for daring to say such words. "'Methinks,' said the king, pausing and smiling at the man, "'the punishment is greater than the fault.' Three days later, Charles the king walked for the last time through the streets of London, from St. James's Palace to Whitehall. The way was lined with soldiers. Soldiers marched in front of him and behind him. The air was filled with the noise of trampling feet and the sound of drums. The scaffold was raised outside the palace of Whitehall, and hundreds of people crowded to see the dreadful end of their king, some in joy, very many in grief and awe. Charles knelt by the block amid deep silence, when a man in a black mask held up the king's head, crying, "'Behold the head of a traitor!' a groan burst from the shuddering crowd. He nothing common did or mean upon that memorable scene, but with his keener eye the axe's edge did try. Nor called the gods with vulgar spite to vindicate his helpless right, but bowed his comely head down as upon a bed. End of chapter 78 Chapter 79 The Commonwealth The Adventures of a Prince King Charles was beheaded on the 30th of January, 1649 A.D., and Parliament immediately proclaimed that kings were bad and useless, so England would have no more. The government would be a commonwealth. Common here means belonging to all, and wealth, although we now use it to mean money, at one time meant well-being or happiness. Commonwealth really means the well-being or happiness of all. No one was to be greater than another. All were to be equal. The House of Lords was, therefore, they said, useless and dangerous, and they did away with it. They also made it a crime for any one to call Prince Charles king, although he was the eldest son of Charles I. The people of Scotland and Ireland, however, were very angry when they heard what had happened. The Scots had never wished the king to be killed. They had hoped to force him to rule better. Now that he was dead they proclaimed his son Charles king. At the same time the Irish rebelled, and Cromwell and his Ironsides went to subdue them. Very many of the Irish were Roman Catholics, and some years before they had risen and cruelly murdered the Irish Protestants. Cromwell hated the Roman Catholics, and he intended now to punish them for their cruelty to the Protestants, as well as for rebelling against the Commonwealth, as the government of Britain was now called. Cromwell remained nine months in Ireland, and so cruel and pitiless was he that for many years no Irishman could hear his name without a shudder and a curse. The country was utterly subdued. Many of the people were killed, others were sent as slaves to the West Indies, and all who could fled to far countries to escape the fury of Cromwell.' 
When he had finished this dreadful work, Cromwell returned to England, and then marched into Scotland. The Ironsides had never been defeated, and now they won battle after battle, and at last Charles decided to march into England and fight for his crown there. Cromwell was very much astonished when he heard what Charles was doing, and he hurried after him as fast as he could. The English did not flock to join Charles as he had expected, and when the two armies met at Worcester, Cromwell's army was nearly twice as large as that of the prince. A dreadful battle followed. The Scots fought gallantly for their prince, but they were utterly defeated. Hardly any escaped, and those who were not killed were sold as slaves. Cromwell called this battle his crowning mercy, for with it Charles lost all hope of regaining his kingdom. It was fought on what Cromwell used to think was his lucky day, the 3rd of September. Charles fled from Worcester, and had many adventures before he reached safety. Great rewards were offered to any one who would tell where he was hiding. Punishment and death threatened those who helped him. Yet so many were faithful to him that he escaped. He cut off his beautiful hair, stained his face and white hands brown, and instead of silk and satin he put on coarse clothes, which were much patched and darned, so that he looked like a laboring man. Then, with an axe over his shoulder, he went into the woods with four brothers, who really were working men, and pretended to cut wood. All day long they stayed in the wood, and at night the four brothers guided the prince to another place. There they found so many of Cromwell's men that it was not safe for Charles to stay in a house. That night he slept in a hayloft. Next day, finding that even there he was not safe, he climbed into an oak tree and lay among the branches. As it was September, the leaves were very thick and hid him well. Charles lay very still and quiet. His heart thumped against his ribs, and he held his breath when some of Cromwell's soldiers rode under the tree. They were so close that he could hear them talk. "'The Lord hath given the ungodly one into our hands,' said one. "'Yea, he cannot be afar off. "'We will use well our eyes. "'Perchance the Lord may deliver the malignant even unto us.' "'But the kind green leaves kept close, "'and little did the round heads think "'that the very man for whom they were looking "'was close above their heads, "'and could hear every word they said.' For a whole long day Charles lay in the oak, and at last Cromwell's men, having searched and searched in vain for him, went away. Then Charles climbed down from the tree and walked many weary miles till his feet were blistered and sore, and his bones ached. At length he reached the house of a royalist lady and gentleman who were kind to him. The lady pretended that she had to go on a journey to visit a sick friend. Charles was dressed as her servant, and mounted upon a horse, and the lady got up behind him. In those days, before there were trains or even coaches, ladies very often travelled like this. They did not ride upon a horse by themselves, but mounted behind a servant or a friend. For many miles Charles travelled as this lady's servant, having many adventures and escapes by the way. As Charles was supposed to be the servant, he had, of course, to look after the horse. One evening, as he went into the stable-yard of the inn, in which they were to spend the night, he found it full of Cromwell's men. One of them looked hard at the prince. "'My friend,' he said, "'I seem to know your face.' "'Like enough,' replied Charles. "'I have travelled a good deal with my masters.' "'Surely,' said the man, "'you were with Mr. Baxter?' "'Yes,' replied the prince calmly. "'I was with him. "'But now make way, my man, till I see after my beast. "'I will talk to you later.' "'So Charles busied himself with his horse, "'and escaped from the man who took him to be a fellow-servant. "'After many dangers, "'often being recognized in spite of his disguises, "'the prince arrived at Lyme Regis, "'and there a little boat was found "'to take him over to France.' But when the captain's wife heard who was going to sail in her husband's boat, she was afraid. She was afraid that Cromwell might hear of it, and perhaps kill her husband. So she told him he must not go. 
"'I must go,' said the captain. "'I have promised.' "'You shall not go,' said his wife, and, seeing that talking did no good, she locked him into a room and took the key away. Charles and his friends waited in vain for the captain, and at last they left Lyme Regis in despair. After more adventures they reached Brighton, and there they really did find a boat and a captain willing to take them over to France. The evening before starting, Charles was having supper at a little inn in Brighton, when the landlord came behind him and kissed his hand. Again he had been recognized, but the landlord was faithful, and would not betray him. "'God bless your majesty,' he said. "'Perhaps I may live to be a lord, and my good wife a lady.' He thought that if Charles ever came back to the throne he would not forget those who had helped and served him when he was poor and in trouble. For more than six weeks Charles had travelled in fear and danger among his bitter enemies. In spite of his disguises many people had recognised him, yet not one had betrayed him. Instead they had taken a great deal of trouble and run many risks to help and save him, and now his difficulties and dangers were over. Very early next morning, while it was still almost dark, the little party crept down to the shore. In the grey dawn Charles stepped on board the boat, the sails were set, and slowly he was carried away from his kingdom, which he was not to see again for many long days. End of chapter 79 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org on Monday, the 21st of August, 2006, at Hugh Maguire's house in Montreal, Canada. Chapter 80 The Commonwealth, the Lord Protector The British had hardly done fighting at home when they had to fight with enemies abroad. They went to war with the Dutch, who at this time had a very famous admiral called Van Tromp. The English, too, had a famous admiral called Blake. The Dutch and the British had several reasons for quarrelling. Each tried to spoil the trade of the other, and the Dutch would not acknowledge the new British government. This made the Parliament very angry. Several fierce battles were fought at sea, and when the Dutch won, Van Tromp hoisted a broom to his masthead as a sign that he intended to sweep the British ships from the seas. Blake and the English were very angry at this. They built and manned more ships as fast as they could, and once more sailed out to fight the Dutch. When the two fleets met, the fiercest, longest battle of this sea war took place. For three days they fought, but in the end Blake was victorious, and bravely though he had fought, Van Tromp was obliged to lower his proud broom, and sweep the remainder of his own fleet homeward. It was now about four years since King Charles had been beheaded. Cromwell was the strongest man in the country, yet no real ruler had been appointed, and the Rump Parliament was acting neither wisely nor well. Cromwell made up his mind to put an end to this. So one day, he marched to Parliament at the head of about three hundred of his soldiers. He himself went into the house, leaving some of his soldiers at the door, some in the lobby, and some on the stairs. He sat down in his usual place, and listened for some time to the talking. Then suddenly he rose up and began to speak. He told the Parliament that the things which they did were unjust, that they were tyrants and worse. "'But your hour hath come,' he cried. "'The Lord hath done with you.' And putting on his hat, he stamped with his foot, and the soldiers rushed in. "'I will put an end to your babbling,' he shouted. And at a signal from their master, the soldiers drove the members out of the hall, Cromwell calling out insulting names at them as they passed. The speaker refused to leave the chair and tried to address the members, but in the noise and confusion he could not make himself heard. Then one of Cromwell's friends took him by the arm, and forced him to go. In a few minutes the hall was cleared of every one, except Cromwell's soldiers and followers. On the table lay the mace, 
the mace is the sign of the dignity and the lawfulness of Parliament. It is carried before the Speaker as he enters and leaves the House, and lies on the table while the members talk together. It is a sign of law and order, just as the scepter is the sign of royalty and rule. Cromwell did not like any form of ceremony. He thought it was foolish and wicked. "'Take away that bauble,' he said angrily, pointing to the mace. So it was removed. Cromwell's friends then left the house, he himself coming last and locking the doors after him. This was the end of the long Parliament. It had lasted for thirteen years. Cromwell and his friends now set to work to form a new Parliament, and one more to their liking than the last had been. Instead of allowing the people to choose the members, Cromwell himself chose them. But this Parliament did not please him much better than the last, and in less than five months it was again dissolved. Cromwell was now asked to become ruler. Some of his friends wished him to take the title of king, but he refused, chiefly because he knew that his greatest friends were the soldiers, and they hated the name of king. If he took that name, he was sure that they would turn against him and become his worst enemies. So he became ruler under the title Lord Protector. Cromwell was not crowned and anointed as kings were, but there was a very solemn service held, when a beautiful purple robe was placed upon his shoulders, the sword of office buckled to his side, and the sceptre put into his hand. He was truly king in everything but name. Cromwell was not only a king, but a very stern and autocratic one. He wanted his own way quite as much as the Stuarts had done, only he really thought of the good of the country, and the Stuarts thought only of themselves. The troubles of the Civil War now began to pass away, and under the stern rule of the Lord Protector, Britain began once more to be peaceful and prosperous at home, and famous abroad. All the Protestants of Europe looked to Cromwell for help and protection, and so powerful was his name that he could always give help. Kings bowed and obeyed when Cromwell commanded, and Britain was famous as she had not been since the days of Elizabeth. Her soldiers were the best in the world. Her admirals won for her the name of Mistress of the Seas, a name which she has kept ever since. Yet the men who had won this great place for Britain lived in terror of his life. He was a tyrant, and like all tyrants, he was bitterly hated, and he knew it. Under his clothes he wore armour, he always carried weapons, and wherever he went he was followed and surrounded by a strong bodyguard. No one ever knew where he would sleep, for he moved about from room to room in his great palace, lest someone should attack him while he rested. At last, Worn out in body and brain, the great Lord Protector died on 3rd of September, 1658 A.D. It was his lucky day. He first put arms in religion's hand, and timorous conscience unto courage manned. The soldier taught that inward mail to wear, and fearing God how they should nothing fear. Those strokes, he said, will pierce through all below, where those that strike from heaven fetch their blow. Astonished armies did their flight prepare, and city strong were stormed by his prayer. In all his wars needs must he triumph when he conquered God still ere he fought with men. End of part 80